What happens when you take King Kong, Godzilla, Norwegian folklore, and Tony Scott, Michael Bay filmmaking aesthetics from the late 90s and early 2000s, and you, 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 you put it into one movie? Well, you get, uh, you get Troll on Netflix. We're going to be talking about that right now on Patio Commentary. Hi, my name is Matt Jarbo. Welcome back to Patio Commentary. And today I sat down and I watched Netflix's newest movie, Troll. Well, of course... It's not the original troll sound, which that came from 2011's found footage documentary, uh, Troll Hunter, which is actually a really solid movie. No longer on Netflix, unfortunately. I think it's on Vudu for like four bucks. But if you haven't seen it, go see that one. But I digress. This is all about Roar Uthog's troll. If you don't, who, don't know who Roar Uthog is, he is the director of 2018's Tomb Raider, which I actually felt was a really serviceable action movie. I thought it adapted the property well. It's something that I would have liked to see him continue. Unfortunately, that franchise is now dead, but we know that he can at least pull it off when it comes to doing action. Here, he chose to take a whole mishmash of different themes and different movies and different things that we know that are familiar and ultimately predictable and kind of bundle it into one movie that is very serviceable, very, very entertaining. And it, with a short runtime of really about 95 minutes without credits, it's one that you can quickly sit down and enjoy or put on in the background or watch with friends and not really feel like you wasted your time. The movie, again, it's, a, it's about a troll. And I feel that's probably like one of the worst things they could have done is name the movie after what it is. I know... It's very much pulling from King Kong and Godzilla and other kaiju monster movies. But I feel like when they're trying to establish the mystery and the suspension of disbelief and the tension leading up to the reveal of the troll, they, they, it would have probably been better if the movie wasn't named that. And that's probably my only real large complaint about the film itself is that it kind of like destroys its own mythos on that front but when it starts diving into like the, the the mythology and the folklore and everything else surrounding trolls and really how roar and his writing partner crafted a story that is heavily centered around norwegian folklore it's actually pretty cool what's funny though like i said is that it is very much wrapped in this in this tony scott michael bay aesthetic where if you've seen if when you watch the movie and you see like how the military scenes are are not only shot, but they are acted, the music, the editing. I mean, it's like, OK, 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 okay I get it. I totally get it. I know what you're going for. I totally understand what you're trying to do. Uh, you're trying to establish that the military doesn't know what they're up against and that our intrepid heroes are the only ones who can save the day which is effectively true because nobody wants to believe that it's a troll. Like you're looking at everything at first and they're like, you see footprints and like no one outside of like the outsiders acknowledge that it's footprints. Everyone else is just like, is it pockets of methane gas? Is it just like, is it just, you know, water logs? Like it, what, what's going on here? Like what's happening to the environment? You know, is this caused by global warming? And you're like, no, it's, it's, it's footprint dude what are you talking about it's, it's a footprint like it's clear as day so i mean like the military people are very much uh, the government eggheads everybody are kind of stupid so that's why they bring in nora teeterman who is a pa <laughs> uh, a paleo uh, what is it paleontologist biologist right paleo paleontology biologist whatever uh she she digs up bones and stuff not unlike dr alan grant from uh the jurassic park series in fact when we first meet Nora's adult character, we see her on a dig site where uh, they're running out of funding and they're dealing with all sorts of crap like that. And then, you know, here comes a helicopter and the military whisks her away. But what's funny, though, is before that, the very first scene of the movie has Nora and her dad, Tobias, and they're scaling a mountain, you know, when she's like 12 or 14. They get to the top of this uh, of this peak and they're looking out over the troll mountains and the dad's telling her this like folklore story about the, you know, 13 different trolls that ended up like getting drunk at a wedding and staying up all night and then getting turned to stone because they were out in the sun. And then she's like, yeah, dad, that's just a folklore. Like, it's not real. You know, I don't see any trolls. And he's like, it's not about, it's not about believing what you're seeing. It's about seeing what you believe, which I thought was really interesting 
considering like the movie's kind of bent on Christianity. Just it's kind of a weird take on my end, but you know, so she kind of like looks at it and he's all like, look with your heart, Nora, look with your heart. You know, I don't know where I did that accent from, but anyway. And so she's like, she looks, you know, and like the music swells. And then all of a sudden you start seeing these troll faces appear in the mountains. And you're like, all right. So like, clearly, you know, he's telling her he's, she's believing what she's seeing or she's seeing what she's believing, but her dad is the one telling her this. And then when we encounter the dad later on, you know, he's like a recluse, a hermit who has been discredited by the government because he he says he was this close to uh, to completely like just pulling back the curtain and unveiling all the information about trolls that they were real, that they existed. And uh, and then that the government like shut him down and they locked him up and everything else in the process. And what was really funny about that is it's all true, which I thought was great. That's where I got like the, more of like a Tony Scott kind of vibe off of it right for some like conspiracy theory sort of stuff but like no it's true the government actually did lock him up in a mental institution for 12 years in order to fundamentally discredit him because he was getting close to revealing the truth that they fully knew that trolls existed and that they had built uh, their palace in oslo on top of the troll king's domain and that this troll is the troll king who just wants to go home that's literally it. Like that is literally why the troll is rampaging its way through uh, Norway is because he just wants to go home. He just wants to go see his family again. Right. And I completely understand that. What's well, really funny though, is again, like there's the military doesn't know what they're up against. And so they do this whole ambush thing and they attack the troll and it does absolutely nothing. But one guy gets injured and like everyone's with this guy. They're trying to like, you know, they're hiding from the troll, but as the troll walks by, he just goes like, he stops and then it cuts back down to the guy, the military guy, and he's holding a cross and he's praying to God. And you start looking at the blood and the cross and you're like, wait a minute, the the, the trolls can smell the blood of Christians. Uh, and then like, they're like, let's get out of here. Let's go. And so they grab everybody and they try to grab the soldier before it's too late. But the troll scoops it up and just pops it in like a Tic Tac. And I thought that was like really funny. And then like the dad is all like trying to like, you know, calm the troll just like he's troll whispering it and then you know the military attacks the troll and the troll turns he swings he clips the dad with the tail kills the dad you know and you're like this is all super freaking predictable this entire thing is super freaking predictable not bad it's entertaining but you just kind of see where things are going but again when they got to the twist about like the troll uh, you know, the, the, how they, how they got rid of the troll King essentially was really fascinating. So when they get to the palace, right, the guards are all like, get down, get out, you know, whatever. And they're like, we need to talk to this guy. And, and they're like, get back, get back. And then the guy walks up and he's like, oh, of course it would be a teeterman. <laughs> Cause he knows he's the one who had the dad locked away. And, but now he takes the daughter and the other guy from the government down into the basement, shows them all the bones of the troll family. And you find out that the Holy King of Norway is the one who commissioned the assassinations, the genocide of the trolls by uh, killing all of them in their sleep, essentially during the day, like, like men, women, children, just slaughtering all the trolls. And then they took one of the kids and they lured the troll king away to uh, to a cave, which is where he was at. And they, they sealed him in there thinking that this is where he's going to stay. And for several hundred years, that's where he was until an excavation team blew a hole in the side of that cave, woke his ass up. And then from there, he went off and starts doing this. So I thought that was really interesting because they basically just go like it was the Christian's fault. When the Christians came in and tried to gentrify this entire country, they wanted to do away with anything that wasn't like in line with Christianity. They wanted to do away with everything that wasn't like normal to them. In fact, it's actually a similar plot point to, I, I think it was like the third pirate, the second or third pirates of the Caribbean movie. I think it was the third one when the East India trading company actually uh, was killing they you know they they killed the kraken and other mythical creatures because it was it was not part of the new world it was in their way of, of commerce and capitalism and business here it's kind of like that but with religion and so they realize okay we need to like get the troll king away from here 
And the best thing we can do is turn them back to stone by using UV light. So they rig this whole thing up on the outskirts of Oslo. They take the skull of like his murdered child with a gigantic like crack in the skull, like because they bludgeoned the kid to death. What I thought was fascinating was like modern military weaponry had no impact on the troll king, not one iota of a hit. But yet the holy Christians were able to figure out a way to drive a spike into the brain of a child. I would like to get more elaboration on that, and maybe we will in the future, because, yeah, the movie sets up a, you know, a troll, too. Uh, they lure the troll out. They blast him with the UV light. He starts to go, ah, ah, ah. You're right, he's doing this whole thing. And then what I thought was really interesting from there was the fact that, like, it starts showing, like, you know, he's in pain. He's writhing in pain. He doesn't know what's going on. He woke up, you know, 500 years later, doesn't know what's happening. And then, like, they're trying to kill him. And, and they're succeeding. And so then, you know, the, the Nora's like, no, it's, it's not right. It's not right. So she like turns off the UV lights and she runs up and she's like, get out of here. Get out of here. We don't love you anymore. You know, she, no, she doesn't always yell at him. But then the son, you know, comes up and ends up just <laughs> kills him right there. He falls over. He dies. They save the day. Uh, and then uh, they go, you know, I wonder if there's any more out there. I wonder, I wonder if there's any more uh, of these trolls that are hanging out out here in, in, a, under, in a cave somewhere. And then like the movie ends and it, it like, what's funny is it goes to a, a mid credit scene showing that uh, the sun that was used to lure the troll king into the cave originally is still alive, not dead. And then he wakes up at the end of the movie, obviously establishing like a troll two type situation. But what I find to be really fascinating about it is like, when I mentioned Godzilla, cause it does feel more like King Kong, but when I mentioned Godzilla, it kind of comes across a little bit like the whole monarch approach that we saw with Kong Skull Island and, and Godzilla and all, you know, the whole monsterverse thing where it's like monarch, you know, it keeps track of all of these creatures. And so I kind of wonder, like, if we're going to get more folklore, like other elements of folklore around the world were not, you know, are real as well. And that could be. Netflix's own approach to some kind of monster versus sort of situation. And because there are a lot of European folklores, uh, as, you know, Norwegian, everything like that. There's a ton of those kind of characters rolling around and they could turn those in the movies. I would like it if they actually spent a little bit more time, um, you know, like in, maybe like working on the acting a little bit. It was a little bit off, but there was a guy in the movie is like the prime minister's assistant. He's kind of like the love interest, kind of like the BFF kind of up in the air on what's going to happen with that, to be fair. Um, but like, he's talking with the military guy and he points out his, you know, his, uh, his, his goggles, his night vision goggles. And he, he correctly identifies them. The military guy's like, Oh, you got any military experience? And he just kind of goes, Hello, call of duty, you know? And he just, but like his delivery was really funny. And I just bust up laughing on that. And then also this guy's a writer and throughout the movie, he's telling the story of like, he's writing the story about a monk who's able to dismember himself in order to like use his head as like a weapon or his fingers can pop off like ninja darts. And it's, it's, it's just, he keeps telling the story to different people. And then at the end of the movie quits his job because he's going to become a writer. Okay, cool. You know what I mean? Like, cool, 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 cool. Uh, just, elements of it are kind of crazy, but again, like this is not a movie to take seriously, even though it did attempt in essence to try to craft a story that was heavily, uh, you know, bathed in Norwegian folklore. And for that, I give it a lot of credit. I think that part of it was a lot of fun. Uh, it's definitely an easy movie to get through. It's only 95 minutes before end credits. So you know what? You're not investing like a lot of time into it, but it's going to be okay. And so if you guys have seen, troll let me know down in the comments section and if there's any other movies you want me to review uh this month let me know i'll talk to you guys later have yourself a great day